Hi, and welcome. I'm Katie. I work at Madison Street Books. I'm here to introduce our authors today. We're joined by Keith Gesson and Anon Gary Hardas um, to discuss Keith's new book. We're so happy to have y'all. Thank you so much for joining us. And I will turn it over to you guys. Thank you and welcome. Um, thanks. Thanks for having us. Keith, it's good, to, good, to, echo. good to be in a conversation with you. It's an it's uh, it's an honor. You're you, like, um, like America's most echo? famous dad at this point. Sorry, you're like now America's most famous dad. <laughs> um, yes, but not actually America's dad. <laughs> no, no one said that. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, you want to start with a little bit of a, a reading for us? Yes, I can do that. Yeah. Uh, this is from Love and Anger. When your baby is born, you think you are a certain kind of person and are going to be a certain kind of parent. It's all a fantasy. You don't know anything about yourself until your baby gets older. You don't know anything about yourself until the day your adorable little boy looks you in the eye, notices that your face is right up close to him and punches you in the nose. The first two years were physical. Breast milk and poop and Raffi's delicate little head that could so easily bump into something. Lack of sleep, of course. Worries that he would choke on something, but we survived. He hit his head a few times, but not too badly. One time he put a giant dead cockroach in his mouth, but I pulled it out and flushed it down the toilet. And then he was two. He was running around and wearing a little hat. And now we have to prevent him from getting hit by a car. He was a loud and rambunctious boy. He liked jumping up and down in his crib or on our bed or on one of us if we made the mistake of lying down. One time my father was visiting and Raffi wanted to show off. So for half an hour, he ran in rapid circles around our small living room yelling, I am fire tuck, I am fire tuck. He got kicked out of daycare for refusing to nap and for jumping up and down in his cot, causing the other children not to nap. Someone around this time told us that the hard part was just beginning. We couldn't believe it. Harder than no sleep, harder than waking up every 10 minutes to Google an imaginary symptom. Yes, Raffi had never been placid or well-behaved, but this was different. He now seemed to know what he was doing when he disobeyed us, and this made it so much worse. The advice books called it testing boundaries. That didn't really capture the experience. Testing boundaries was your coworker sending emails on the weekend. This was your coworker when you picked him up, starting to scratch you. You turned him around so that he couldn't do that, and he reared his head back and headbutted you. He'd start swinging his little feet and sometimes would catch you in the balls. There was frustration involved, but also actual physical pain. He'd throw his milk bottle at you and it would hit you in the head. Sometimes we tried to reason with him. Other times we gave him a timeout, putting him in his room and locking the door for a few minutes. But he would come back out a few minutes later and just do whatever had gotten him in trouble again. Then he would get another timeout. He noticed the timeouts and didn't like them, but they didn't seem to affect his behavior very much. I found the episodes of hitting and scratching very upsetting. There was the pain, that was part of it. But there was also the feeling of betrayal. Our little baby boy, whom we had fed and clothed and cuddled, was this how he repaid us? Something else as well, fear. Was this our kid? Was this what he was like? Had we done something wrong as parents that was causing this? Was it too late to correct course? All these thoughts and fears mixed together in moments of conflict and came forth for me as outrage. One time when Emily was already quite pregnant with Raffi's little brother, we had a conflict over dinner. Raffi didn't want to eat his. He demanded a totally different dinner. Emily was inclined to let him have it. I disagreed. We had already run the bath for one thing, and for another, it was a perfectly fine dinner. After some back and forth, Raffi picked up my glass of water and doused me with it. What the fuck? I tore off my wet shirt, picked up Raffi, stripped him of his clothes, 
and jammed him into the warm bath. He was terrified and bawling. I felt out of control. Emily was scared. She went into the bathroom to comfort Raffi while I stood in the living room and gradually started to feel remorseful. Eventually I went to apologize. Emily urged Raffi to accept my apology. Raffi was reluctant. That is not nice, said Raffi. And it was true. It was turning out that data was not nice. Okay. That's wow. Fun. That's what they call relatable content or either, either that or I am your uh, perfect demo for this um, remarkable book, Raising Raffi, which uh, if you haven't read it yet, uh, but we're drawn to today's conversation is just a, a an excellent, funny, uh, as you as you heard there, um, thoughtful, uh, sad, dark, and uplifting book all at the same time. Really, really amazing work, um, Keith. So I, I want to start by Thank you. asking you. You know, fa fatherhood is, according to scientists, a quite old phenomenon. Uh, been going on for quite some time now. And yet the literature of it is somewhat scantier than that kind of tradition suggests. And certainly the literature of it, the modern phenomenon of fatherhood is scantier still. Um, you're a big reader as you scanned and just read through what others had written about fatherhood uh, or parenthood. What did you feel was missing that you wanted to kind of put on the bookshelf? Uh, sure. Like, you know, I mean, one of, one of the things that I talk about at the beginning of the book is this conversation that I had with my own father about um, my second grade teacher, Miss Lynch. Um, and I was very struck by this conversation because I, I just interviewed Miss Lynch for one of the chapters in the book. And then I was talking to my dad and I said, do you remember Miss Lynch? I just talked to her. And he said, who's that? And, and I said, my second grade teacher is my favorite teacher. And he said, oh, no, I, I don't remember. And I said, well, surely you met her at a parent teacher conference. And he said, well, <laughs> no, I, I I wouldn't have gone to one of those. I was at work. And and he just he just found it hilarious, the concept that um, that he would, you know, leave work or or you know, arrange his schedule in such a manner that that he would attend the parent teacher conference, right? Whereas for me and and i and most of the dads i know for you i know you know um you would never miss a parent teacher conference right it's so interesting you get so much information um and also the way we work has changed right so so that conversation really brought home to me that like we were part of a different generation just just in terms of how we relate to our kids and their lives and our own kind of presence in those lives. Um, and it did seem in the parenting, I mean, there's this kind of interesting phenomenon where the expert literature, right, going back a hundred years is primarily written by men, like Dr. Spock, right? Um, the sort of, you know, PJ or, you know, the, the kind of the, the giants of developmental psychology. Um, all the people giving you advice over the years, Dr. Sears, Michelle Cohen, they're all men, right? Um, and then the memoiristic literature is written by women. And a lot of it is excellent. Um, really, like, I mean, it's like you kind of, you kind of throw a dart at a random um, sort of parenting memoir um, written by women, it's, it's often excellent. <laughs> Um, and whereas, yeah, the, the male versions of those books um, tend to, as I say, they tend to fall into like dumb dad, um, I can't do anything right, or like super dad, I am the greatest dad who ever lived. Um, and it just didn't, it, it didn't seem to describe the world of dads that I was part of, right? Um, who, who I still think are not you're not not quite equal to our partners in, in terms of how much parenting we do with with exceptions that exist but overall um, we don't do as much parenting but we take it seriously we're involved um, and when we don't do a good job it 
bothers us <laughs> a lot. Um, and I, I think we, we think about it and, and kind of worry about it maybe more than our fathers did. I love that. I remember, I, I don't want to get uh, criticized by like art historians who are watching this, but I, I remember someone saying to me once, um, so it's like art hearsay in an art museum that I think there's no or almost no documented paintings of fathers holding their children until 20th century art. Like, and in, in just go, go back hundreds, thousands of years of human beings making art and just that kind of intimate imagery, um, which is so normal for us, um, just absent from the record. Um, and it tells you, it tells you a lot. So I think a lot of this uh, book is about your breaking under the pressure of fatherhood and then your edification by the process of fatherhood. So I, I wanted you to maybe answer the question in what ways, in what particular ways have you been maybe irrevocably broken by the process of fatherhood? And in what ways have you deepened and grown and become better? Hmm. I mean, part of it I feel is a certain amount of confusion about the rupture that fatherhood represents in your in like certainly my day to day life um, radically changed um, after we had Rafi and and then changed again after we had Ilya, um, our second kid. Like you're just you're just you're you wake up much earlier, <laughs> you know. I feel like I used to wake up at like nine. That, that seemed like a nice time to wake up, you know. Um, I don't, I don't know. Last time I woke up at nine, I guess yes. Like I, I have COVID, so I, I was allowed to sleep in <laughs> yesterday. Um, but you know, so you're kind of and and just your concern. You have to get this baby fed. You have to get him dressed. You have to get him to daycare. You have to pick him up from daycare. It's just this world of concern and worry that didn't exist before. Um, and so you feel like a completely different person who is who is destroyed, who behaves in a way that you would never expected yourself to behave. I don't know how you experienced this, but I've I've been very surprised, you know, that chapter about anger. I was surprised that I was that I could become so angry. Um, it's not something I expected of myself. And it and it's taken me a while to kind of come around to the idea that I mean it's not a great thing. But it's it's manageable, and it's it's not the worst thing um, to be a you know a slightly irritable, impatient person. <laughs> um, you know you, you want to keep it in balance. But like, so, so in, in that sense, so I, I discovered things about myself that I didn't like. Right, um, and, and at the same time even as my life was kind of overturned and revolutionized, I also discovered that I was pretty much the same person, right? And I couldn't magically transform into the kind of perfect, either like empathetic parent described in some parenting books or like the totally stoical parent described, you know, in other, in other books. Um, and I was gonna kind of have, find my own you know, muddle, muddling through a way of being a parent. Um, that's no, that's, that's great. Um, and I want to ask you a little bit about, I mean, on that last point, the, I think something that's really great about this book is that it's not only a zoomed in look at, um, at the kind of micro experience within a family, within a household, but the, um, the system um that we live in is a is a presence in the book in the sense that the reason it's the reason you're getting angry is not just you know personal circumstances uh but because the childcare situation is what it is in this country because the you know daycare situation is what it is in this country because uh, the health insurance situation is what it is the housing situation and 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 you you touch on a lot of these things you don't you don't kind of evacuate the 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 systemic that is bearing down on 
you. And then, but, but I think so many of us as parents forget those bigger things, even if we know them and we're just experiencing this, like, why is this so rage? You know, why, like, why am I? And it's because we live in this really bizarre system in which there's no support. And I just wonder if you could reflect a little bit on the kind of that role of the system um, and the absence of a system in this country as you see it playing into, you know, parenthood. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you see it in these books about parenting in other places, right? And the most famous example is this book about French parenting, right? Bringing a Baby, which, you know, describes this kind of utopia of parenting where um, they, at a young age, you leave your children at the creche, um, which is this high quality government subsidized daycare where the teachers are highly trained professionals. They take their work very seriously. They teach the kids French, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and then on the weekends, you drop your kids off at the grandparents estate. <laughs> um, it's very good to have <laughs> French grandparents with an estate. Yes. Um, and, you know, but your French parents, are very energetic, or grandparents rather, and you know they take the kids for weeks at a time, and and you you know and this book is presented as like, well, why don't you Americans parent that way? And and you're like, oh yeah, I should, there's something wrong with me that I'm not a French parent. And then you kind of step back and think about it, and you're like, no, I those things are are, are not available to me, right? Um, I mean, I, 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 do, I do think the fact that, I don't know what the statistics are on this, but you know, just the fact that so many of us live far away from our own parents and don't have that support, right? Especially kind of like, well, I think a, a, a lot of us, right? Um, and, 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 you know, A, don't, don't have the support just kind of on a day-to-day, -day, like childcare level, um, but also don't have, that kind of memory and tradition being passed on, um, you know, which may be for the best, right? Like the way our parents raised us in certain ways, not the way we want to raise our own kids. Um, but it, it does create more anxiety and the sense that you really have to like invent the thing anew um, with the parents being part away. Alternate side parking, something, you know, um, we haven't talked about enough in this conversation, <laughs> but, but that, you know, it's not in the book, but I was thinking, I was thinking today, I was like, why, why was it so important to me to get Rafi out of the house, you know, into daycare uh, at, in a reasonable time frame? And the answer actually is a lot of the time I had to move my car, you know, and so the, the pressure to move my car by 9 a.m. was causing a lot of stress in our family. Um, not that I'm against all, I mean, they do need to clear, clean the streets. Um, but you do, you know, and this is, you know, you, you read about parenting other places and you're like, oh, it's so wonderful. Um, I should do more of that. Um, but, the, but the fact is you can't. I mean, that's, you don't have, you're not in that situation. In certain ways, our situation in the US is enviable. We have high income, right? We have um, access to a lot of stuff. Um, but but around raising kids, it becomes a lot of these things um, kind of the rubber hits the road and it becomes, you know, really lonely and, and uh, high stress. Um, I want to ask you, you know, there's some couples where there's, you know, one one writer and then the other person does a, you know, normal job, a, a, you know, a kind of respectable, uh, you know, job uh but you come from one of these households uh, double writer households and you do different kinds of writing you think about different kinds of things but on this subject one could easily imagine either of you as you know having written uh, a book on this subject chronicling this time period dealing with these issues and themes and i wonder you know what it was like you writing the 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 parenting book, the the fatherhood memoir, um, as Emily kind of watched you parent and imagining maybe if you have imagined it, 
what her equivalent book would have said and how it would have differed telling the her own story of the same time and place and, and situation. Um, yeah, I mean, Emily's written about Rafi quite a bit in, in various places. Um, I feel like she didn't write this particular book because she was writing a novel, Perfect Tune, about motherhood and the kind of difficulty of having a creative career and being a mother um, and, and trying to do those things at the same time. Um, so that's that's what she was working on um, when Rafi was little. Um, you know, the genesis of the book for me was this essay about teaching Rafi Russian. Um, it was the first one I wrote. It was, um, I wrote it when he was around three, which was when he kind of became conscious of the fact that I was speaking Russian to him, um, that I was speaking English to his mother, um, that this was a kind of particular thing that was happening and, and he, that he had mixed feelings about. And then it turned out I had mixed feelings about it because, you know, um, it, it wasn't, you know, a language like Spanish or Italian um, where it would result in him going somewhere nice, <laughs> right? Um, it was a it was a language that might result in him going to Russia, which did I actually want that? I don't know. Still don't know. You know, I don't want him to go right now. Um, in the future, Russia that is free, um, that would be great. But you know, but so that was the f first essay that I wrote, and then I I started kind of you know. Uh, Thinking about him learning Russian, um, thinking about what it meant for our relationship, thinking about what kind of history I was introducing him to. Um, and that was very much something that Emily was not doing, right? It was very separate from her kind of experience with Rafi. Um, and then, you know, the next essay I wrote was about schools, um, which was because. Uh, Ilya had just been born when it was kind of time for us to find Rafi a pre-K. So I was kind of deputized to go out and, and find a school. So I was the one kind of going to the school tours and having these experiences around that. Um, and so I ended up writing that essay. And then the third essay was the essay that I read from, which was about anger. Um, and certainly Emily also gets mad <laughs> at Rafi. Um, but uh, not as frequently, and it's a different sort of thing, right? Like, I mean, sort of a father's anger is is different from a mother's anger, and I think the kids experience differently. And I, I don't know, so it, it felt to me like a very, a very different book from the one that Emily would write. I mean, I hope she does write eventually, to be honest, um, you know, really raising Rafi. <laughs> <laughs> By Emily. Exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I've all, all the stuff that she's written about Rafi, I have loved so much um, and been so grateful for. And I, don't, I would love, I would love to read more of it. She has a great amount of insight into his little mind. Um, you write so intimately and and well about intimate life here, but you also, of course, write about politics and these kind of big forces in the world. So I want to ask you something connecting those two things a little bit. A lot of this book to me is about the generation of men that you and I belong to, where I think we're at this kind of exact age where a whole bunch of older ways of being a man have been totally discredited, largely like within our lifetime. I mean, some of those were largely acceptable well into you and I being alive, like I've been <laughs> oh, to become, five years from, ago, right, yep. right, and then from I mean, and I'm I'm talking about the very predatory, you know, all the way to just like expectations about you know who does stuff, um, and and the things you're talking about about parent teacher conferences and, and we just really lived through a sea change, but I think we're also at an age where you teach at uh, Columbia. When I go to college campuses, I also feel like the the young men 20 years younger than me on those campuses, I feel like they're gonna be in a completely different world 
even from where you and I are and their assumptions and their kind of fluidity with some of these concepts and roles and boundaries. Um, and so the, I think a signature of the time and place, the cohort you and I belong to is kind of this role confusion, like this in-between time for these roles. And that's what brings me to the political aspect. When you, when, when you look at um, phenomena like Trumpism in this country, which is so connected to male role confusion and men not knowing, men like clear that they can't be that but like not sure what the next thing is and really just lost about who they are. I wonder if you could just reflect on, it's not only fatherhood, it's masculinity broadly, but reflect on that as a political phenomenon that we are really living with the consequences of. Yeah, I mean, that's something I would love for you to talk about, but I'll start. <laughs> I didn't I, write the book. Um, yeah, but. You, you, you're, you have very interesting thoughts about this stuff. Um, I mean, I had the, the, the interesting experience actually, Emily recently, I don't know if you saw this, she, you know, the, the Roe um, virtual weight decision after it leaked, um, you know, and it was very upsetting. And Emily I think, tweeted something like, you know, are we really, are we really gonna do Father's Day this year? Is that something we're really gonna do? And it just became like within 24 hours, it would, was this major tweet event, um, which was picked up by the right wing. Eventually, Don Jr. retweeted it. Um, yeah, saying something like, they're coming for Father's Day, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, and I can't even imagine what Emily's inbox was like. My inbox just like DMs, people being like, your wife is a this and that, you know, poor you, you know. And it was just like, what is wrong with you? Like what, why is your life, so, are you so threatened <laughs> by everything that's happening in the world that someone making like a little joke or, or even, you know, potentially an attack, on Father's Day, um, it just causes you to like lose your mind, right? Um, so it, it did feel like a, a some kind of moment of yeah of of confusion of like trying to like hold on to these very thin symbolic things, right? Um, because you because you no longer have I don't know. Um, economic, economic power, cultural power. I'm not sure. You tell me. Why were these people so upset about Father's Day? I mean, think about and the the fact that Don Jr. was maybe the most prominent retweeter of that is significant, right? Don Jr. to me is like ex falls exactly into this thesis, right? He's like father and grandfather are these clear, like toxic, truly awful violent in some abusive uh toxic males of that old model mm -hmm. uh, and don jr has kind of all of the arrogance and the and the um the kind of self-image of it but he's like not he's like not that i mean i don't know if that's good or bad like he's just not that he's just not he's not he's kind of this totally weak figure who's like mm -hmm. he's like who's like wearing the suit of like his toxic dad, and he's trying to be toxic. He's like aspiring toxic, right? But he's kind of just this like super, he, to, to me, he's totally confused guy. And like, my guess is, I mean, his, anyone who, if that's your father, you're probably pretty screwed up. But like, my guess is his sons, you know, I don't know if he has son, I don't, I don't know a lot about his, his, uh, his family, but uh, that they will have sorted something out in spite of being from the most ridiculous family in this country. But to me, Don Jr. like epitomizes this like kind of shell game of this hollowed out idea of being a man without any kind of successor or thing in sight. He just doesn't, like he doesn't, like Donald Trump knows who he is. Like Don Jr. does not know who he is, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, so when I, when I, when I have like re reported on this in terms of 
I'll take regular voters and what motivates them. You know, the, there's you, there's the really small like fascist hardcore who are just really true believers. But I think in the kind of larger next adjacent group who are voting with them, but are not them necessarily. I think there's just a lot of a tremendous amount of lostness that's being kind of inverted into certainty and a tremendous amount of, you know, pain that's being kind of inverted into anger. And I honestly think at some deep level, they just literally have no idea who the hell they are, who they're supposed to be. They just don't know. Um, and in some ways, this is obviously their own failure, but I, I also tend to think of these things as also like shared failures, you know, because we all end up living in hell when you, the, the, you have a lot of resources intellectually to navigate your lostness through this, right? And the book is you doing that. But a lot of people mm -hmm. don't have the intellectual and other resources to like figure something like this out, take it on like a problem. I mean, you were, you were almost broken by this challenge, right? Imagine people who just like can't think and read the way you do and who can't, you know, um, process maybe the way the way you have in the book i i think it's a phenomenon that's going to be with us for a really really long time um yeah. uh, i want to ask you about uh money i think one of the things <laughs> i really um i like in the book i admire you know both you and emily i think share this kind of openness about um the difficulties of new york city and money and certainly in the context of parenthood which is the most expensive endeavor in the world. Um, can you talk about, you know, love and money are often like kind of pitted again, you know, the kind of separate different things belong in different categories, but falling in love with someone, trying to build a home with them, and then trying to try to be a good parent to not one, but two people in a crowded city um, suddenly implicates all these questions of money and what kind of life would cost what, can you talk about the role of money in, in, in the first five years? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I try to think back to my relationship with money before the kids were born. And it's certainly something I thought about a lot. And it, but it was, it was a kind of abstract, or I was just kind of interested in it. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I don't have any money. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, ha I had some money for a minute, but now I don't, you know, and, and then, you know, something happens and I'm like, oh, I have a little bit of money. Um, I've never been very smart about money. Um, and, you know, uh, but, but yeah, I've, I've always, it's always been kind of part of my, in my fiction, I, it's always there. You always kind of know, I like, I love the um, part of Ulysses at the end of uh, the end of Ulysses. Leopold Bloom sits down and he does like an accounting of the day, exactly how much he spent on every little thing. I've always really appreciated that. And I thought that was the kind of an important part of all literature is is to know like well, where's the money coming from, where's it going, you know, how much is this person spending, how much are they making. Um, but it, it, it does change when you have kids in the sense of like, you want to get them stuff and, and sometimes you can't if you don't have money. Um, you know, and it's really become very real for us recently because our housing situation is precarious, right? We, we are in this apartment that we're um, getting kicked out of because we couldn't afford to buy it and somebody else bought it. Um, so our kids have to move for the third time. One, two, three. Yeah. Um, in, in three years, basically, uh, you know, partly, partly are doing, but partly, partly not. Um, and I mean, there's, there's a kind of passage in the book where I talk about, um, Worrying that uh, Rafi's not gonna. That I, I, I haven't. You know, I, I grew up in this kind of immigrant household where you know, the sort of precarity was just a fact of life. And and my parents, without really, without trying at all, 
indeed trying the opposite, <laughs> right, to make me feel safe and secure, nonetheless, were able to kind of pass on to me the fact that, you know, if if you don't work, you won't have money. And if you don't have money, then things could go wrong, you know, pretty quickly. Um, and I was like, ah, uh, you know, Rafi's not going to have that sense of the world, you know, because he's not an immigrant. But um, now he might. <laughs> so <laughs> it all worked out. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it just, it does become um, not having, you know, um, money does become much more real when, when kids are involved. At the same time, um, you know, at, at times when we've like really had no money, for example, like right when Rafi was born, we, we kind of adjusted and we dealt with it. And, you know, we like accepted all the stuff that people wanted to give us, right? Like everything in Rafi's nursery was passed down to us um, by friends. And, you know, and then as like, as we were making more money, we kind of spent more money on, on stuff. Um, and, and I don't know, so it, it, it's not like totally determinative of everything. Um, and, you know, if I look at, you know, about 50% of every day, I'm like, I really should have lived my life completely differently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, not found myself in the position I find myself in now. Um, but the other half of the time, I think, you know, um, this is the path I chose and and it's also the path that Emily chose and um, we're gonna see it through, you know, and we'll see what happens. I love that. Um, something I'm curious about, you write about ex trying to explain different things to Rafi in the book, you, uh, you talk about race, and the reckonings of 2020 and trying to explain that you're trying to explain russia trying to explain uh conflict all kinds of things and and i have this experience because our kids are the same age where sometimes you're surprised by what they can grasp sometimes you're surprised by what they cannot grasp it's not necessarily intuitive um what are the easy things and what are the hard things i was particularly curious about his rafi's ability over the last several months to grasp the concept of being the subject of a book. I mean, at a certain level, it's an easy thing to understand, uh, you know, easier than war or something like that. At another level, uh, to, to understand the implication of being on a shelf forever, being like archived forever and chronicled this way is probably beyond the grasp of a young child his age. How do you assess what he has grasped about this and what he has not. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question that I have been very um, attuned to, <laughs> you know, the past few months. Um, Rafi now knows how to read. Which Good, is job. Interesting. Good job. Good um, job. Had nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> his, his very heroic kindergarten teacher and then his very heroic first grade teacher and the a Nintendo game, um, some Nintendo game or Animal, Animal Crossing. Animal Crossing, yes. Um, taught him how to read. So so he's been kind of um, picking up, you know, he, I mean, he, he's, he's known that we were writers for a long time. Um, we, we uh, you know, don't sell out of our books so as a result, we have a lot of our books kind of lying <laughs> around the house. Um, so, you know, we always, we're always like, hey, Rafi, who wrote that? <laughs> and he's like, you? Mama? And then I'm like, no, Mama wrote that. So he's been, he's been aware um, of that for a long time. Um, and, but it's, it is different. <laughs> it is different when, when he's, you know, obviously, when A, he can read, and B, the book is, has his name in it. Um, and so he's been, he's been sort of picking it up uh, 
you know, now and again over the last couple of months and like looking in it. Um, he hasn't read the whole thing by any means, but he, he was very upset at, at the end. I said that he used to um, put two chairs on top of one another and um, in the mornings uh, while we were asleep and try to get to the candy on the top shelf. Um, and he said, he's, he read that and he said, I don't do that anymore. You know, it's not true. And I was like, well, but you did do that <laughs> until like a few weeks ago. <laughs> but for him, it was a total lie. Um, and anyway, and he's had some very perceptive things to say also. I mean, he, he, was, he started reading it at one point and he said, um, this shouldn't be called Raising Rafi. It should be called All of Dad's Thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> which is accurate, right? Like he's like, there's not enough about Rafi in here. <laughs> Where's the Rafi content? <laughs> oh my God. What I can tell you is when yeah. the fifth copy arrived in our home, the reaction it caused was my seven-year-old being incredibly jealous that his mm. first five years did not inspire. It's, it's not like I'm not a writer. Like I'm literally a writer. I literally could have done the same thing. And just, yeah. according to him, chose not to <laughs> something he can't fathom and then and then and then with some jealousy in his voice he asked did Rafi get to draw that cover and I was like actually he did not according to sources so uh so that I think like assuaged the the, the situation a little yeah. but it was you fun. wrote a book about billionaires instead of writing a book about yeah them. exactly exactly so yeah. I should you know, I mean, I, I should have written a book about my son being a billionaire and then maybe it would have happened. Um, so I think it's now is the moment uh, to have audience questions. So if you have questions for um, Keith about fatherhood, about uh, Russia, about war, about Ukraine, just like you get you hit him with anything you want. I fully endorse that. Um, and and I don't even know how uh, these questions are presented or there we go there you are <laughs> okay yeah if anybody has a question you guys can type it in the ask a question thing down there um great we, i'm gonna i'm gonna should i keep going while you while we wait yeah um I, I we actually have a, a first question already um great how did you choose a conversation partner Um, oh, uh, Anand is a, um, a brilliant <laughs> writer and a fellow dad in my neighborhood and someone I admire a great deal. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. I, li I like that. Uh, like, where did you find this guy question? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, <who> is <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's not the first time. It's not the first time someone has asked that in connection with me. <laughs> Yeah. I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky to have been talking to him. Anand, how did you talk to your son about Trump? It's funny. I mean, it, it was, I felt it was easy, but I feel it's had bad consequences long term, by which I mean, like, I feel like Trump is easier to explain than, you know, George W. Bush in the sense that, like, it, it was, it's an easy thing for a child to understand, like, Trump's a monster. He's bad. He's like an evil person, right? Like, I feel like, it's very, it's it's very children's book friendly. That it's like mm. the nuance. It's clear. Um, it, it doesn't require like a second sentence of explanation. And so I actually felt it very easy to explain it to him. Like he's a bad man. He doesn't like people who are different. He wants to scare people. Like right. I think kids like totally get that. As opposed to like Mitt Romney wanting to cut the deficit in a way that has the consequence of making it really really hard to make it in America. Like kids can't get that. But like, Trump, I feel like kids can get a kind of capsule version of Trumpism. The bad consequence it had is that it kind of has laid a template for him with politics in general. What he basically just asked me when I when I mentioned someone, is that a good person or a bad person? Oh, right? Like, like many Americans, he now has this paradigm. But it's just interesting that like because that was like the age of like dawning consciousness of any of these things that's kind of like the only question now it's like team good and team bad and like while in this moment that actually continues to be a useful analysis i kind mm -hmm. of am aware that i've like because of not not me personally but just because of 
me trying to explain it in that time and moment he was in, his like political consciousness is perhaps affected in this kind of very binary, black and white, like Manichaean way that I think is interesting. Yeah, he's polarized. Is polarized. All right, we have more questions. Uh, do you have plans for another book? Do I have plans for another book? Um, I have some vague notions, um, but it's, I have found, you know, the advice they give you is like, by the time you, you, you know, put out your, your, this book, you need to have, you need to be working on your next book. I have never on it. I don't, I don't know how about you, but I've never been able to do that. I'm like pretty focused on this book and just kind of thinking about it and, and like just thinking about how to, how to talk about it and worrying about its sales ranking um, to really <laughs> uh, think about the next book. I don't know, have you, are you able to think like a book ahead? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you can't tell by looking at us, Keith and I are, uh, we're athletes of words. And so athletes need an off season, you know, you need, you need to rest, uh, you need, I don't know, spring, I don't know a lot about sports, but spring training, uh, <laughs> exercise, things like that. So we're, you know, you need your off. And this is true, actually. You really, like, the rhythm of writing a book, thinking about a book, writing a, writing a book, the rhythm of promoting a book. These are all like very cognitively different spaces and different postures. I think, you know, um, I spend a lot of time when I'm, when I'm researching a book, I'm gathering, I'm like sucking things in for the world. I'm like not putting a lot out. I don't tweet as much, et cetera. And then when I'm writing the book, you're putting things out, but only to yourself. And so that's, it's a kind of different thing. And then you go, you go talk about the book in the moment you're in now, you're like outward broadcasting a lot and probably not taking in as much. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you gotta like, and then you gotta go back to, you know, drinking the world in. So it's kind of nice to have these uh, seasons, I find. Yeah, I, I do remember very vividly during, when I was um, touring with A Terrible Country, which was, my novel about Russia and my grandmother who was sort of suffering from dementia and that experience. And, um, you know, I, that was a tour in which I talked a lot about both dementia and Russia, which were things I, I didn't mind talking about, but I found I really wanted to talk about Rafi. <laughs> I, you know, he was, he was three and we just had, oh, you know, I was just like, I was just full of stories about Rafi and, really wanted to talk about him. So I, I actually feel like the germ of this book was uh, was kind of born at that in that period where I really wanted, like I found myself really wanting to talk about him and his adventures. Um, but right now I still I still only want to talk about Rafi actually. <laughs> I found, sorry, then we'll get to no. the next question. I, I totally agree with this in that you know, it unfortunately only works for me like retrospectively, but I found that each book, if you actually think about it retrospectively, it was very obvious that the germ of it being actually a few years before you started it was quite obvious. And it was usually the thing that was like irritating you, but you didn't, and you were like always cornering people at parties to like say something about, or, you know, and like, you're like, oh, it was so there. I was so, you know, but unfortunately it, it, it needs to break the surface of consciousness. So I, I wish there was an easier way to, I, I hate actually how long it takes sometimes to figure out the next thing. It should be obvious. It's right there, but you got to figure out what that thing is that's been kind of eating you up or that you've been wanting to tell the world about or whatever. Um, there's another one down here. Uh, number one parenting tip for either. Okay. Oh, number one parenting tip. Can I, can I amend that question, Keith, for you? I, wanna, I want you to say the number one parenting tip that you absorb from someone else, and then I'm, and your number one parenting tip for others. Number one parenting tip. I mean, if I'm going to be honest, um, I read an entire book called um, One Two Three Magic. <laughs> it's a whole it's a whole book. It's like a three hundred page book about counting to three. Um, you, you wouldn't think that somebody could write a whole 300 page book about it, but, but they did, this guy did. It's a pretty good book. It's, it's, I mean, it's not like, it's, he's not like teaching you how to count to three, 
it's more like scenarios of like, what happens if you get to three <laughs> and, and your child is not complying? But, but I have to say, um, counting to three works. It, it creates a kind of, or counting to five or 10, it creates this drama. You know, it's not like, it's, it's a little threatening because like, what's gonna happen if data gets to three? What's gonna happen? I mean, sometimes data says, if I get to three, no dessert, you know? If I get to three, you lose 10 minutes of TV. Um, you, you don't wanna tell them they're gonna lose TV entirely because you lose then too. But if they lose 10 minutes, 10 minutes from what? They don't know. <laughs> so anyway, um, so counting to three is, is good advice. And the best advice, and this is in the book, um, but you should still buy it, but I'm going to tell it to you for free, um, is uh, you have to live close to your daycare. That's I, I love things that are so practical because those things actually really matter with parenthood. Um, all right, next, next audience question. What do we got? Do you have any more down there? Yeah. All right, I'm going to, can, can I ask, a, Please. Can I, can yeah. I take a audience privileges. Um, what do you, I'm curious what you're still trying to work out that you have not yet worked out on this question of fatherhood. You did a lot of working out. You, 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 you tried to resolve as one does in writing some of these things. I wonder what you, what are you still far from on this mm. score? Um, Emily suggests <laughs> from an, a, from the other part of the apartment that I should be focusing um, on other members of the family besides just Rafi <laughs> um, in my future endeavors. Um, I you mean, the, the, the truth is, sorry? You can do a whole series, one book per <laughs> nuclear family member. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't think that would go over well. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think the, the, tr the truth is, you know, I wrote the book, but like, I still have all these problems. You know, <laughs> like I, I wrote a whole essay about getting mad, you know, and, but I still get mad. Right. Um, it didn't go away. You know, I didn't, I didn't magically solve the problem by writing an essay. Um, I still have these mixed feelings about Russian. Um, we were going to go this summer. We're not going this summer, obviously. Um, so uh, I, I feel like I've worked through a few things, but but most of the things that I kind of bring up in the book, whether it's you know anger or um, ambivalence about Russian or sports. I'm still kind of, I'm still in it. I haven't, I haven't emerged from it. I love that. Yeah, I feel, I feel the same way about it. Um, do we have time for more audience questions, or we need um, to? <clears throat> there's no more. There's no more posted. Um, but if you we have just exhausted, we've like answered yeah. every single thing they wondered. We've um, assuaged every doubt. I'm so glad. Um, Keith, I want to just thank you for writing such a great book that helped me actually process not five, but seven. Uh, by the time the book came out, the, the, my first seven years of parenthood and fatherhood. Um, and it was, as I said at the top, so relatable and honest and raw. Uh, and, you know, books like this don't write themselves so make sure you actually buy this book if you are watching um and support great independent bookstores like madison street books um because that's how we get people <laughs> to um tell tell truths like this and and share reflections like this um so thank you to madison street books and thank you keith for an awesome book that i encourage all of you to check out thank you so much for, for doing this and for your kind words. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, guys. We'll go ahead and sign off. Um, it was a lovely event. Thank you so much. All right. Good night. And I'll see you in, see you in under, Underwood. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Bye. Bye.